you know, people need to go for their dreams. There's an interesting movie called The Bucket List, where people talked about what do I want to do before I kick the bucket? And, uh, you know, we've been fortunate we've been able to do most of the things that are on our bucket list. <laughs> Hello, I am Celia Sanker, Executive Director of the Diversity Canada Foundation, and this is the Golden Voices Golden Years Fireside Chat. Today we have as our guests two very adventurous people, Judy and Aubrey Millard, and they are going to share with us how they, in retirement, took life uh, as it came and went on an adventure all around the world. Judy and Aubrey are going to share with us how they follow their passions and we hope that it also inspires you to follow your dreams. So uh, before we do that, take a closer look at the adventures that you have. Tell us a bit about yourselves um, in your, let's say, your ordinary regular lives. Well, I was a uh, guidance counselor and uh, high school teacher. I was also a Navy Reserve officer, and that's what, of course, triggered my interest in sailing and traveling. So I've always been interested in traveling. That's why when we retired, I said, let's take off, and we did. And I was a dentist, um, but had been interested in sailing since at about the age of four, I had the book Swallows and Amazons read to me. It's one of a series of stories about children sailing in the English Lake Country, which my father had read as they were published and loved and wanted to sail from then on. Learned when I was about 12 and had a series of small dinghies, but it was all small dinghies and day sailing. And then I met Aubrey, who also was interested in sailing and had a dinghy. And then the plans could grow. Judy was always jealous of the fact that I got my training with the Navy, courtesy of Her Majesty's government, whereas Judy had to pay to take her courses and teach courses for the Canadian Power and Sail Squadron. So, so here we have two sailors. Um, was it sailing that brought you together? Um, I'm not quite sure. Did you know that you were had a love of sailing when you first met? I think it came up fairly quickly. What brought us together was some uh, mutual friends inviting us both to dinner. This is when we were living in Espanola, and I'd on a Friday afternoon or Friday noon gone out to the local Chinese restaurant for lunch, and got a fortune cookie that said and I quote, a good evening for romance. And I thought, oh, sure, I'm going to Vincent Elaine's for supper. Well, I went to Vincent Elaine's for supper, and they had another guest, Aubrey. And we've been together ever since. Yeah, it worked out quite well, because they knew we had similar interests. And Judy had found a couple of other people who said, oh, I'm glad you two got together. We were meaning to uh, get you together because we thought you'd have a lot in common, which, of course, we did. So it's uh, been, uh, you know, a, a couple of matchmakers in Espanola put us together because they thought we would be a good match, and we were. How early in the relationship, or how, because, you know, to sail around the world with, uh, to go on these adventures, having a partner that can uh, see you through that adventure is so important. So how early and how d did you get to that understanding that uh, this is someone who can help me realize that dream of such a grand adventure? Well, um, it, was, it, it was quite early. I, once we knew one another and realized each that this was of interest to the other, uh, within the first year, we had actually gone together on the purchase of a very large cruising, well, very large for that time, a 39-foot cruising sailboat. Um, 
unfortunately, the boat was a lovely design, but was uh, there were problems in the construction. So we never actually owned that boat. The boat owned it, or sorry, the bank owned it, and we had a very small minority interest. Before that, remember, we had uh, Windspray, and we had a checkout cruise. Windspray was a, a smaller 21-foot uh, sailboat that was trailerable. And to check us out, we decided to trailer it down to Florida <laughs> at Christmas time. And so we were taking a sailboat <laughs> through to St. Marie, Michigan, and going down in a raging snowstorm with a sailboat in tow. Uh, and uh, we used that as a checkout. We spent four or five days sailing around the Florida Keys, and we knew that we were quite compatible. However, I also learned another interesting thing, because when we were going down the highway from Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, to towards Detroit, uh, there was black ice on the highway. And at one point in time, we lost control because the weight of the trailer was pushing the car. And as I eased off the brake or eased off the gas, the car started to sway. And then we lost control and the car went right around 180 degree turn into a snow bank. And the first thing I said, is the boat okay? And Judy said, yes, and so am I. <laughs> so I, I learned uh, an important lesson with that one as well. Yes, when, when a number of years after that, and after we were uh, together, you know, we've been together for a while, uh, the day that I phoned him, phoned him, who was down at that down in Toronto, to say, uh, I had an accident and I kind of wrecked your lovely little Mercedes convertible. He said he'd learned, and the first thing was, are you okay? Then he said, and just what did you do to the car? <laughs> I'd hit a bear. It was, it was a bad scene, generally. These are occupational hazards up here in northern Ontario. However, she hasn't hit her bear since. You know, I'm, I'm getting um, so much from that, um, just that those couple of scenarios uh, as to what makes this work, because um, uh, the, the way that you learn each other, each other's likes, dislikes, uh, um, and you adapt. And um, when they, they, I've heard from lots of other couples that it it is when the the husband learns to behave <laughs> he learns from his wife you know that is what makes a, a happy a long and happy marriage well after all we women are perfect don't we all know that okay so um i want to take a look at um when you started the the world adventure sailing around the, the world. Uh, so how old would you have been and how did you arrange your lives so that you could go on such a lovely adventure? Well, I retired at 59 and Judy is younger than I am and she wasn't quite ready for it. And uh, so I indicated that, well, Toronto and that I would take off with our boat and I'd single hand it down to the Caribbean and she could fly down and join me for holidays. And then I'd single hand it over to the Mediterranean and she could fly over and join me for holidays or she could come. And she thought for a whole 25 seconds and said, no, I'm coming too. So she retired at that point in time earlier in her career than she initially planned. But there's been no looking back uh, ever since. Uh, and Judy has enjoyed the sailing. She enjoyed her work as a dentist but uh, she's gotten on to another phase of her life uh, with me in retirement, and we've been enjoying it ever since. In fact, one of the things we want to do is to encourage people to go for their dreams and go for it earlier in your life rather than later, because if we had put things off, we might not have been in the physical uh, ability to have done what we did. And so far, we're still good. I don't really consider myself old. I, I haven't reached that stage yet, even though I'm 83 years old right now. But we still have our boat, and right now it's stuck down in Mexico, because it, uh, and we were planning to ship it 
to Chicago last year. However, COVID blocked all the borders, so our boat is still stuck down in Mexico. But our plans are to have it shipped up to Chicago, uh, hopefully later this summer, and we'll fly down and we will sail it back up here to Lake Huron, where we will have it in a yacht club within a half hour's drive of our home. And so uh, we are still very interested in doing that. Uh, but we would not have been able to have done the world cruising that we did if we hadn't done it as early as we did. So we, we're fortunate to have good health, but I would encourage people to go for their dreams while they're able to, not, not put it off. The other aspect of how we were able to is that with Aubrey being a teacher and having gotten into teaching when he did, he's got a very good pension. We're living on his pension, not what I made as a dentist. I was a much better dentist than I was a businesswoman. So my income was never all that high. Uh, but um, I mean, in terms of doing what we did, you need to have skills, but people, if you're interested, you can learn the skills. You need to have, the things you really need are a mutual interest in whatever it is, in our case, it was sailing. Um, enough money, which is a very flexible uh, term, but we have never lived lavishly. Eating out happens because we're somewhere else and don't have time to go home and cook. In part, this is because we're quite good cooks, both of us, and we cook better than many of the restaurants that we're willing to pay to go to. But, um, you know, um, and uh, my, I don't go much for fancy clothes or fancy, uh, these earrings are my kind of fancy jewelry. I bought them at a crafts uh, sale for, I think, $10. That's my version of good jewelry. Yeah, I'm, I'm lucky that Judy doesn't have an interest in furs or clothing or jewelry. For her, it's going to a, a good hardware store oh, yeah. where she can see all kinds of gadgets. Well, and, and now a fabric store. I'm spending a lot of money on fabric because I've gotten into quilting. But you, so you need enough money. You need the partner with the shared interest. And you need to be fortunate in your choice of ancestors. You need to be healthy enough to be able to do this. Um, the skills are... If you're interested in it, you can learn them. You don't have to have those before. Well, if it's going off world sailing, you'd better have the skills before you leave. But you don't have to have them before you decide you want to leave. You just have to then learn how. Another interesting aspect about going for your dream that deters a lot of people are what I call the golden chains. And people are afraid to take off for their dreams because they're going to be leaving behind their grandchildren and the community involvement that they had uh, because they are leaving that. Um, and so people have to be prepared for that kind of a emotional break from some of the traditional things that they have enjoyed. However, if you are to off traveling, you still can go back once or twice a year. But as I say, those golden chains often trap people into staying where they are rather than taking the risk to go for some of their dreams. Uh, and again, you can go for your dreams and then come on back. Like we've come back now to shore life. We are living in an apartment for the first time in 20 years. Uh, and it's nice and comfortable and we're making our uh, way within the community. We're involved in community activities, but we still enjoy our sailing and having a sailboat in our local yacht club is a nice way of uh, enjoying life. So we haven't given up the dream, but we've just modified it a bit and we've come back to a traditional lifestyle. Yes, there's so much there that I, I want to follow up on uh, Judy and Aubrey. So uh, in terms of those relationships, uh, what was the reaction from friends and family and people around you, work colleagues, when you said, when you revealed that you are going to take off and be on a, a world adventure? 
you've got to be nuts. Um, uh, there was certainly envy. I, I specifically remember, and, and there was some, uh, it wasn't really, an, it was a negative, but it wasn't. I had one lady who was a patient and friend who, as we were getting ready to leave, gave me as a going away gift, uh, the book of A Perfect Storm saying that she hoped it would change my mind. She'd finally found a dentist she was comfortable co coming to see, and now I was leaving. So those situations came up more with Judy than with me. I'd always been a wandering type because I spent much time with the Navy, and so uh, it wasn't as difficult uh, for me. Uh, whereas uh, Judy had, both my parents had passed away before I, I retired, whereas Judy had both of her parents still alive and her sisters in that. And I remember one of the comments that her mother made uh, after we had been out. Uh, she said, you know, they, they've been living on this boat for a couple of years and they haven't killed each other yet. It must be love. <laughs> so they acknowledged the fact that, you know, we were able to do it. And this was part of our dream. One of the other ones was again with my, my mother saying, uh, what, what about if there's a problem and we need your help? And my response was, I, unless we're in the middle of an ocean, we can be back in under a week from anywhere in the world, uh, usually less. And, and phoned my parents to say, hi, we're here, everything's fine. And they said, well, actually, it isn't here. We need you. And that was a Thursday and we needed to get the boat back to Istanbul to leave her for an indefinite period. Um, on the Tuesday evening, we were back in Toronto to help take care of my mother as she was dying. So the, the aspect of being away, especially, I mean, now with, with uh, internet communication and Zoom calls and that you can be very close, except for physically, um, from basically anywhere in the world, uh, again, as, as long as there's internet, it's mid-ocean doesn't work. If you're needed, you can be back as long as you have enough money to be able to make the flights. And if it's a concern, that's something that people should kind of include in their budgeting, is enough to be able to fly back to wherever, wherever you happen to be. That situation also provided us a a good example of how people around the world are very considerate. For example, when we we were in a place called Stinop, was it? On yes. the Black Sea coast of Turkey, the northern coast of Turkey, and we had to sail as fast as possible back to Istanbul. And that would have been a three-day sail uh, using our engine as much as we could. And so we had to periodically stop someplace to refuel. And in Turkey, we would go into a, an anchorage. We would take our dinghy ashore with jerry can, empty jerry cans. And as soon as we were, the first car that passed us would generally stop and say, uh, can we take you someplace? And we said, yeah, we're after some fuel, diesel for our boat. Okay, fine. And they would take us to the uh, gas station. And then after we f filled that up, they said, well, do you want to pick up any groceries? Um, uh, we said, no, we, we've got to get going uh, because Judy's mother is sick. And we've got to get home as fast as possible. And in two situations, the woman said, your mother is sick. We will pray for her. And these were Muslims in northern Turkey who didn't know us from anything. But I'm quite sure that you know they were that concerned they and would offer their prayers for Judy's mother. And so this, you know, restored, mind you, we found the people in Turkey, the friendliest people we've ever met. Turkey was by far our favorite spot. Uh, Newfoundland comes close in terms, <laughs> of the fa in terms of the how nice people are. Our experience in Turkey put it at about 99.9%. .9%. Um, most places it's only 98, and there are some where it drops down to maybe 95% yeah, who are nice. Yeah, we found people around the world quite helpful. And also within the sailing fraternity, um, sailboaters will always help each other. And in many cases, they say, you know, nobody would ask for money. But they say, you know, 
pass it on to the next person. Uh, we had a, an interesting time when we were sailing into the Thames River, uh, our alternator engine. And so we decided, rather than going on up the Thames, we went into the Medway River, which is uh, near the uh, North Channel or the English Channel side of Thames. Well, we tried. And as we were going in, the tide changed, and so we had the tide against us. And so we were zigzagging, tracking back and forth, trying to get in under sail only. And then we saw a large container ship coming towards us. It was going into the Medway as well. So we called Medway Radio and said, Medway Radio, uh, this is a sailboat Valeta 4. We are outside. We have no engine power trying to get in, and there is a large ship coming. Can you be of assistance? And they replied, oh, you're the guys that have been playing out there for the last hour or two. We were wondering what was happening. And so they sent a, a small boat out and they towed us in to a, a nice anchorage. And uh, one of our other boaters that was there indicated that some fishermen heard your problem with your alternator belt and they sent over an auxiliary belt that you might be able to use. And we well, that was nice. However, while we were there, we went ashore and we got the proper alternator belt. And a few days later, when we were leaving, we called Medway Radio and said, Medway Radio, there was a fisherman who offered us this belt. We dropped it off us, with our friends. We, we got another belt anyway. We don't need it. Uh, is there any way of contacting this fisherman? And he spontaneously came on the net and said, oh, hi, Valeta, this, this is so-and-so. Uh, yeah, we appreciate that. I'll tell you what, give it to somebody else who might need it. So the idea is that you pass on these elements. And we've we found that in many cases that, uh, you know, you, you help somebody and then that person then passes it on to somebody else. So we found that the, the sailing fraternity is very supportive that way. Yes, that sounds like a, a wonderful community to be part of, everybody helping each other. So, uh, Judy, you mentioned that uh, if someone is going to take off on an adventure like this, they need to have skills. And both of you mentioned a bit about your your experience and your background in sailing. But let's take a, a deeper dive <laughs> into that and tell me a bit more about uh, how your uh, initiation into the sailing world and, and the world of um, underwater, how that prepared you for taking off on such an adventure in your later years after retirement? Okay. I started uh, sailing when I was about 11, when our, my father, who had wanted to sail since he was about 10, and started reading that those same books. Um, when we finally bought a small sailing catamaran dinghy and joined a sailing club in Toronto. And uh, the routine with this was we kept it on land and there was a crane at the club, but we had to move it physically to the, to the uh, crane. So generally my father and I, age 11 or 12, and my sister, aged uh, seven or eight, would go down, and Barbara and I would be on one side of the ding of the catamaran. It's just about a ten, um, eight foot, well, twelve foot pontoons, about an eight foot deck. Barbara and I would be on one side carrying, and my father on the other side, and we would carry it over to the crane and launch it, and then all get on. And we were actually too much. The, the boat was really set for a smaller number, but none of us wanted to not go. And we'd go out sailing, and invariably the wind would die because it would be late afternoon, and we'd be late home for supper, and my mother would be irritated because we were late home for supper when we'd known when we should be. But this was the routine. And then I, my sister and I joined the... Or, the junior club at this sailing club, and that's where we learned to sail in small dinghies. And um, basically, from then on, I had a boat of one sort or another, but this was, oh, 12 foot length maximum until I met Aubrey. And when I met him, I had a little uh, 
quasar dinghy. It's one of these small things that you almost sit on rather than in. And he had a petrel, which was about a 13 foot dinghy. And that's what we had at first. And then together we bought this wind spray, the 21 footer. I also, while I was at university, joined the Canadian Power and Sail Squadrons and took boating classes and te started teaching boating classes with them. And this is an organization that teaches, boat, that promotes safe boating through education. So it's a theoretical rather than on the water course they run during the winter but the courses teach everything from rules of the road and parts of the boat right up through celestial navigation how to find out star sites a skill that's very little used these days because gps makes life so much easier so that was my background and i just kept sailing until well, not until I met Aubrey. I kept sailing by myself until I met Aubrey, and then I sailed with him. And his training was with the Canadian Navy. Yeah, Judy was always jealous because I got all my training uh, courtesy of Her Majesty. And paid for. And, and, uh, and another area, too, is that while I was in the Navy, I was also a clearance diving officer. So I was quite comfortable in underwater diving. And Judy had, uh, had taken... Uh, her uh, Maui courses, and so she's a certified scuba diver as well. So that was just another area of common interest. And to encourage people to go for their dreams, for example, uh, people might not want to do a, a sailing thing like we are, but on the other hand, there's no reason why they couldn't hop in an RV and travel all around North America with a trailer or an RV at cottage into a permanent home and live in a nice rustic environment uh, where they have an opportunity to live that way. So that you know, people need to go for their dreams. They, you know, there's an interesting movie called The Bucket List, where people talked about what do I want to do before I kick the bucket? And uh, you know, we've been fortunate we've been able to do most of the things that are on our bucket list. I've got only one other thing, and Judy won't let me do it. No way. I, I want to I do some skydiving. No way. You're not doing that. No, we're, we, we've done other things. We've done parasailing and uh, things of that nature. But uh, Judy doesn't want me to do the skydiving one. So that's about the only thing that I haven't done that I'd like to try some point in time. Uh, but it's worthwhile for people to, to go for and plan their dreams. It can be either a full-time or a part-time thing, whether it's something living on a sailboat or living in a recreational vehicle or just pursuing a hobby such as photography or hiking or collecting something and go for it That's more awesome. intensively. So that, uh, you know, people can go for their dreams in a variety of ways, but it's, it's important to keep dreams alive. Yes, that's a, a um, that's so important, Aubrey. That uh, you know, it doesn't have to be sailing. It can be whatever makes someone passionate. Whatever is someone is passionate about. Whatever makes someone uh, wake up and just want to jump out of bed and get into whatever activity that makes them feel alive and happy to be, uh, you know experiencing whatever they're experiencing when they're involved in their passion, their hobby, their adventure. Uh, now, we were just speaking about their skills, and you mentioned having the dream and following through with it, but it does require us, I imagine, going on a, a world adventure, some planning. How long did it take you on what was involved in uh, the preparation before you actually said, okay, I am... Uh, leaving the ordinary day-to-day -day life and I'm going to go on my adventures. What was involved in preparing for that? Well, we had the boat before we retired. Uh, in fact, one of the reasons for getting that particular boat was the possibility of a liveaboard experience on it. And once we retired, we were free to use it as much as we wanted or as little as we wanted. So that's why we made the decision. We, we sold our house in Toronto and moved on to the boat and haven't looked back since. I remember the, well, 
the a few times I've looked back, <laughs> especially when I was feeling particularly seasick. But yes, Judy is a great trooper. She still, unfortunately, does get seasick uh, in heavy weather, but she still goes ahead with it. But when we sold our house, I remember the the, the night we had finalized the deal. We were driving back, and Judy says, "Well, how do you feel now that we've sold our home?" I said, well, you know, mixed feelings. It's a big step. And she said, do you have the smell of burning bridges? And this is what happens when you have to make some decisions, but not all decisions have to be that world shattering. So that, uh, and the other thing we're getting out of is the fact that we don't need to keep accumulating money. We're at the point now where we can spend our money. That's why we decided to go for an apartment rather than a house. We didn't want to accumulate capital. We wanted to be able to live off the investments and the pensions we've got and use the money now while we can, rather than putting it more into investments. And that, that takes a, a bit of a, a mental shift to stop thinking about saving and investing to spending and enjoying. Yeah, Aubrey hasn't actually finished making that shift yet, but it, I'm working on him. Yes. The other thing in terms of preparing, I mean, um, once we got the boat, we started making whatever changes, and this is our 32 foot boat that we actually went cruising on, making whatever changes we wanted to get it the way we wanted. And, it's, it's an ongoing process. When we made the decision that we were actually going to leave, uh, in terms of preparing the boat, we probably, we, we decided that we were doing it um, with a date about six months before we actually left. So one of the things that we did was each of us made up a list of things that we needed for the boat uh, that we wanted to, ha to have on the boat or to do for the boat, divided into, I think, three different categories. Maybe it was four. There were things that we needed that were things for each of us, things that are essential. We must have these and we must do them before we leave. There were things that were highly desirable. Um, we really, it would be really good to have this done before and preferably before we leave, but not necessarily before we leave. There were things that would be nice. It would be good to have this, but it doesn't matter that much. And there were things that were totally unnecessary and not wished for. And then we combined our lists. And before we actually left, we had done everything on the absolutely crucial list a great deal of the highly desirable list and some of the it would be nice because it depended on how easy things were. But it was a work in pros. I mean, at this moment, while the boat is down in Mexico waiting to be brought back, after we were living on board for 21 years, uh, I have in a corner of the, uh, the uh, bedroom the new depth sounder that needs to be installed, because of course you have to repair things. Doing it once doesn't mean it's done. It means it's done until next time you have to do it. So um, it's specifically with living on a boat, though not only with living on a boat, it's always a work in process. If you wait until you've got everything ready before you go, you'll never go because things are never all ready. You've got to deal with Whatever is crucial should be done in advance. But after that, it keeps on going. Yeah. The, the crucial thing for us, especially on the sailboat, was safety. So we wanted to make sure that we had all the necessary safety precautions on the boat. Once we set, when we initially set off, we didn't say, oh, we're going to be gone for 20 years. We thought, let's sail down to the Caribbean and see what it's like, make our decisions. And they thought, well, hey, rather than going out the usual way, which is out the intercoastal waterway, we went up the Great Lakes and down through Chicago into the Illinois River, which empties into the Mississippi River. And then we went down the Mississippi to the Gulf of Mexico. 
And then when we were down there, we played around in the Bahamas crossing. So we then, that year, we then decided to do that and we made our Atlantic crossing. Once we were over in England, we thought, well, let's do a circumnavigation around the UK. And after we did that, we said, well, where to next? Well, let's go down to the Mediterranean. And so we went through the rivers of France down through to the Mediterranean. And then once we were in the Mediterranean playing around there for a year or two, we thought, well, let's go up to the Black Sea. You know, it was almost a, a year by year kind of thought. At any point in time, we could have said, let's stop, sell the boat and go home uh, or whatever. Um, and so it was just on a year by year basis. So as I say, when we set off, we didn't initially say we're going to be gone for 20 years or we're going to be gone for one year. We just left it open ended and made our decisions and uh, choices as we uh, moved. Yeah. In general, um, because I'm navigator, I would have the route for the next month would be quite detailed. The route for the season would be quite, would be fairly detailed. Um, the following season, season being sailing season, not like summer, spring, spring, summer, winter. Um, but the, the following year would be roughed out. And after that, who knows? Another interesting thing about uh, retirement going for dream is that technology has improved so much that people have the opportunity to invest in these dreams safely. Uh, when we initially started out sailing, uh, there was no GPS. We used traditional methods. In fact, we at one point in time, we used to know nav um, celestial navigation and that, but we've never had to use it because now we have GPS. Uh, when we started, it was what they call Loran, which was a more primitive kind of navigation system. But when I look at the technology that people can use to enjoy life, I, I, I wish I were 30 years younger because I'd love to do skydiving. I would love to do uh, oh. some of the mountain biking. I would love to do some of the way it permits us to do now. And uh, so this technology has allowed people, I think, more opportunity to pursue their dreams safely with a little bit of training and awareness. But uh, the, the technology has definitely opened up many avenues for people to go for their dreams. Remember when I said that inside my head I was 25, but the rest of me doesn't match? I think Aubrey's about 17, but the rest doesn't match. That, that's why I don't see myself as a, an yeah. old person. So uh, 20, 21 years, that's a lot of time to be out there on the seas. Uh, you must have had some... Uh, really beautiful, fantastic scenery, and also in an adventure. Adventure also brings danger and uh, trials. Uh, let's take a look at both. What were some of the most beautiful places? We'll take a look at the, the beautiful side of it first. Uh, so you were, you've been all around the world. What were some of the most outstanding places you've seen? Well, well for me, I think, especially because I'm prejudiced towards sailing, I think sailors are the last of the romantics, that traveling around the world is a, a romantic idea. Uh, and for me, I think the two or three high points in sailing, for me, one of the beautiful things is sailing at nighttime on calm or comfortable conditions, that you're out there, the, the water and the star, the stars are fantastic at night. And in the water, there's what they call bioluminescence, where waves and that will create uh, lights in the water. And you can see the waves of your boat in white streams. In fact, I've even seen the white streams of a dolphin at nighttime playing around the boat. You can just see the, the swash like uh, of the boat whenever dolphins come around and they play around in the bow wave of the boat. And Judy goes up forward there and she's clapping and saying how beautiful they are. Yeah, they're, they're lovely. When you go to a, a sequarium or something like that and the dolphins put on a show, 
we know that they know that they're getting paid for it. They're getting paid in fish, but they're getting paid for it. When you're out on a boat and see a pot of dolphins quarter mile off, change their course and come and start playing around the bow of the boat. And if they don't seem to be noticed, one of them will come and jump right next to the cockpit where we're sitting to make sure we know they're there and then go up to play so that to make sure that we're aware of them and are appreciating them. That's wonderful. Um, as we said earlier, I, I get, I still get seasick on our Atlantic crossing going over to Europe. I think I ate about six actual meals in the 44 sailing days because I wasn't throwing up. I just, the thought of food made me feel worse. So I didn't, but except when I felt my absolute worst, the whales and the dolphins made it worthwhile. When I felt particularly horrible, they almost made it worthwhile. But that was the situation where when I described this to my mother, she, I described it to my mother and she said, why are you still doing this? And I said, well, it's my dream. And she said, if that's a dream, what do you call a nightmare? But in terms of scenery, I have to say that the British Columbia coast has been one of the most beautiful places we've been. Although I've got to, I have a bias towards the climate in the Caribbean. I still feel that the ideal climate is one where getting dressed in the morning involves a bathing suit. Yeah, Judy uh, likes the soft life that way. And she doesn't know how I convinced her to go up to the British Columbia coast. We, we spent a couple of years on the BC coast going all the way up to Alaska and Juneau and enjoying the icebergs. In fact, I've got a picture of Judy uh, standing at the base of a glacier. And she's all dressed, and this is in the middle of August, but she's all dressed up. She, I describe her as my Michelin man. She's so thickly padded because of trying to keep warm. But uh, she's been a good trooper, and she still went along with it. And that's why we're enjoying down south. Mind you, though, we still come back frequently. Most times it would have been for three, three, two, three weeks or so. Um, because it was to come back to visit family. Um, the longest was nine months when we were back uh, nursing my mother. And when she died, it was late fall. And the boat was in Istanbul, which is the same latitude as Toronto. So going back there to the boat for the winter didn't make any sense. It would be perhaps beneficial for my father to still have somebody else in the house. So we stayed for the rest of the winter, but it, it varied. Uh, there were times, I think there was once or twice that it was just a, a trip back for a week or so. It didn't make sense to come back for much less than that by the time you add flights in. Um, Aubrey was back for, I think, about a week to for his granddaughter's wedding. Things like this. No, we were back when, when Judy's father was passed away. We were back for several months at that point in time as well. I guess the longest stretch that we were not back was when we went across the Atlantic. You yeah. Know, from the time we left the uh, Mississippi, and uh, we went across the Atlantic and spent time. We didn't uh, have a chance to come back when we were over in England, did we? Well, we didn't need to because yeah. my fam, my parents came over there to visit, to visit with my sister who lived in France. So that um, takes a look at. Uh, some of the, the beautiful parts of sailing. And we mentioned a bit about climate, but in terms of weather, maybe that will allow us to take a look at some of the not so fun parts of following your dream and what that can involve. Your dream is not always perfect. No, and the bad ones always, all of our bad ones involve weather. Sometimes it's it's like the situation of the person who enjoys bashing his head against a brick wall because it's so nice when it stops. And uh, similarly, you know, when you have heavy weather, you've got no choice but to go with it. You can't outrun it. And uh, so you just have to uh, deal with it. And sailboats are usually very reliable uh, vessels in heavy storms. You 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 reduce your sail area. You uh, change your course so that you're in the most appropriate course. You don't worry about trying to get someplace in a hurry. You just deal with the weather. And 
the I think the most treacherous times have been when we've been out there in a thunderstorm or electrical storm. Yeah. You're yeah. out there on the water. Your mast is the tallest thing for miles around, almost like a, a magnet for lightning. And at those times, and that's quite serious, because if a vessel gets hit by lightning, we've heard of horrible stories where the lightning goes through the boat and knocks holes in the boat and the boat sinks. And we've found that I at least uh, become uh, fatalistic. I figure we've done everything we possibly can. If we get hit by lightning, we cannot control it. And we're in the hands of fate. Uh, and so I, I can accept that kind of fatalistic approach. Judy, on the other hand, she goes down below and she whimpers. <laughs> so I accept it. I just am not happy about it. Now, I think um, in general, deep water, with the exception of either lightning or being in a hurricane, and you can generally avoid things like hurricanes by paying attention to the season. They are a seasonal thing. So when we were in a hurricane area, we did not sail during hurricane season, or we didn't sail any great distance, We and we watched the weather very closely. But um, in general, deep water doesn't sink boats, rocks do. So the most frightening, there are basically two really frightening instances, or the, the two most frightened times I've had when we've been out. Um, well, one of them was a thunderstorm. That was actually up in Lake Huron before we left on our long cruise. And uh, essentially, we, we found ourselves in a cold front with the associated thunderstorms. The normal summer thunderstorm is over in about 45 minutes, which doesn't mean it's less severe. It just means that it ends. But we had about three, four hours in the middle of the night. It was light more than it was dark because of the lightning. We prepared the boat as well as we could. Um, there are things you can do about in ensuring that uh, you're, you've got grounding so that if you are hit by lightning, there's a path that doesn't involve blowing holes in the bottom of the boat for the electricity to exit into the water. Uh, but um, once you've done those, there's not a lot else you can do. So I've got to say, Aubrey was there and being fatalistic. I was not as good. There, there are, I felt I had four possible emotional responses to this the situation we were in. There was bravery, which at that point was beyond me. There was stark screaming panic, which was going to be very unproductive and even more dangerous. There was prayer, but um, prayer requires that first you believe that there's something to pray to, which actually I don't. A certain amount of conceit that your prayers will be the ones being listened to amongst the millions of people praying at the same time. I think I'm a good person, but I don't think I'm that good. Or there was whimpering. I whimpered a great deal. The other circumstance had us actually moored to a dock in a small town in Greece when bad weather came in from the opposite direction to what the weather forecast had indicated. And um, we ended up that night hanging by a single heavy rope given to us by a local fishing boat because our lines kept breaking, hanging off the side of that fishing boat. Uh, and if the line broke, I knew that the boat was lost and I didn't know if we would make it out of the water alive. But again, that's because we were close to land. In general, if you're out at sea, you can ride with the weather and accept in true conditions, the boat can handle that. The boat doesn't handle being bashed up on rocks. That's interesting as uh, uh, someone who has not been out to sea, uh, the thought of being out there with no land around, that seems scary, but you're saying it's the opposite. That's uh, where you're safest, if you are in rough weather. Well, 
if the land is, if, if you are in the lee of the land, this means that the wind is blowing from the land towards you, then that's safe. But when the land is downwind, when the boat will be blown onto the land, that's extremely dangerous. All depends on the direction. This is another advantage of being full time in that you can wait for the weather. If people go down and charter a boat for a week, say, hey, if there are storms coming, we'll wait for a few days until that storm cell has passed away. And so that you've got the, the luxury of rather than going into it. Yes, and so when you're out on an adventure, you have to be prepared for whatever comes and take it, take it um, in stride. So I've heard someone say that um, if you say that you have been a liverboard and you were out for three years on a boat, that actually means, means that you spent one and a half years maintaining and fixing a boat. How much of your experience reflects that? How much of your time was consumed in actually uh, keeping the boat in tip-top shape, as opposed to um, anch anchoring and just laying back, soaking up the sun? Probably most of it. We did some of the lying back and soaking up the sun. And I'm, and I'm sure that we probably did as much as our fellow cruisers did. It's just that when you look and see somebody else sitting and lounging while you're in the middle of rebuilding, of, of cleaning out the toilet and re, uh, rebuilding the, uh, the toilet, I, I swear I've learned more about marine plumbing than I ever wanted to, but I can rebuild at least our marine toilet quite effectively, as long as I've got the spare parts. You see somebody else lounging about and you feel very hard done by because you should be able to be lazy. When you're sitting there lying on, lounging on deck and reading a book, you don't look at the other boats and see that they're busy working. Um, yeah, there's, there's always maintenance to do. And the thing about being out on a boat is that mostly you have to do it yourself. Well, let me rephrase that. There are two ways of maintaining a boat, um, whether you're cruising or, or just keeping it up in general. You can do a great deal of work yourself and spend quite a lot of money on parts. Or you can get somebody else to do it all and spend an obscene amount of money. Uh, we, but we lived on a budget. We did a lot of work ourselves. There are things that I know that I don't know how to do. but you learn how to do a great deal. Well, this is one of the, the challenges uh, that you've got to be able to do it yourself. And uh, I think accepting the challenges is part of going for your dream because your dream often will take you out of your comfort zone. I remember a, a number of years ago before I met Judy um, and I wanted to live in a log cabin for the winter. I thought the logs would be able to insulate it enough. And so I found a log that in the wintertime I used my snowmobile to come around. But I lived in a log cabin, no electricity. I used, uh, I think, not sure whether I had propane or not, but I used a wood stove and it was a fantastic experience. Uh, people thought I was nuts. Uh, you were. But it was an interesting way of uh, on Golden Pond itself. And uh, initially, people would say, you're nuts. And then, especially with the men, I could see a certain amount of almost envy that I had that kind of seclusion uh, and uh, experience of living on your own, having to use your own devices in order to survive. And uh, I think this is possibly what many of the challenges are for going for your dream. It gives you that opportunity to, to challenge yourself. That's right. Uh, and that's a, a, what you mentioned about that cabin adventure. It shows that you've had that spirit all along and uh, taking that into an adventure around the world on a boat. That seemed to have been a, a natural progression in terms of your dreams getting bigger and bigger. Um, so... 
you mentioned earlier about um, you know, and we were talking earlier about the partnership and having uh, an adventure together. What did being out there on a boat in the middle of an ocean teach you about um, relationship and working together as a couple on a shared dream? Well, we, we had to work together on a sailboat. Uh, finding now that we're on shore, Judy is a bit more isolated from me because she's doing her quilting. And so she's got her own little room set up for her quilting that I can't participate in. But when you're on a boat, you both have to work on it in terms of the maintenance and the navigation. And so it almost forces us, not unwillingly, but it forces us to work together on it. Whereas as I say now, we're back home, uh, I'm on my laptop, and Judy's on her quilting. On the boat, it was physically impossible to be more than about 17 feet apart. And this was this involved one person being all the way up in the bow and the other person being back in the cockpit. I mean, you can't be further apart than that. It also, of course, it, well, it, it worked fine when we were at sea. It, this didn't apply because when you can't be more than 20 feet from food, it's an awful lot easier to snack. In... The 20 years out of sea, what would you say were the biggest life lessons that you learned from your adventures? How much we needed, how much we could depend one on the other. In addition to that, I think uh, it's my faith in human nature because we fought in a strange land and it was helpful to be able to talk to people who were very helpful, not only the, the locals that we met in the different countries we were in, but also our fellow cruisers in that. That's beautiful. So someone whose dream involves uh, taking them away from home and into different lands and different cultures uh, need not be afraid of the unknown. In fact, the uh, people that they meet are likely to be, as Judy said, 95 or more percent. Um, you know, you'd see the good nature of of um, people that that you meet. Yes, as long as you go into it, if you go in being friendly and pleasant, you'll almost always get that back. If you go in with a, well, in our country we do, you'll get that back. So um, what you bring is what you get almost all the time. You'll meet some people who are nice even to people who are nasty, and you'll meet some people who are nasty even to people who are nice. But in general, uh, the, the, the pleasanter you are to the people where you are, the pleasanter they'll be back. So we've had a wonderful time today speaking with Judy and Aubrey Millard on their adventures, sailing around the world for two decades and just enjoying life, enjoying their golden years. Thank you so much for being with us and sharing these memories that uh, Judy and Aubrey have of uh, different places, different people, different cultures, and experiencing how wonderful life can be when you follow your dreams. And I hope this has inspired you to follow your dreams as well, whatever they may be, and come back once again to join us on the Golden Voices, Golden Years Fireside Chat, where we will have lots of more interesting stories to share with you. Thank you and have a wonderful day.